short notice. We appreciate your concern and your interest in the budget and what we're doing about the federal budget deficit. I understand you've been briefed in some detail on our fiscal 87 budget proposal and probably what you were just doing when I came in. Yes, sir. I hope I could take it. Did you get it? Well, I finished. <laughs> <laughs> obstacle to a future of growth and prosperity. It's the year to decide whether we can make the tough decisions that we agreed to last year when the Graham Rudman Holland legislation became law. It's clear to the world that our commitment to peace through strength will not be compromised. And a year to maintain our continued opposition to raising taxes, which I believe could harm the economy and take money from Americans in order to protect government programs we don't need and can't afford. Today, deficit reduction is now the law of the land. Graham Rudman Holland mandates a declining deficit path leading to a balanced budget in fiscal year 1991. And I don't mind sharing with you that my dream is that when that moment comes, we put into place a constitutional amendment that says that the budgets will remain balanced from then on. And I'm going to run over to the Jefferson Memorial to see if that statue is smiling <laughs> because he is the first one who ever mentioned that. At the time of the ratification of the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson said it contains, or it does not contain, it has one glaring omission. It does not have a prohibition against the federal government borrowing. So I think after 200 years we ought to catch up with Jefferson. The deficit will be cut. The big question is how. The Graham Rudman Holland's automatic spending cuts are triggered only if Congress abdicates its constitutional responsibility and fails to pass a deficit or a budget that meets the deficit targets. And in other words, Congress still has a choice. It can be responsible by making those careful and sometimes difficult spending decisions, or it can simply drop the ball and the across the board cuts take over. The budget that I will soon be submitting to Congress was carefully prepared by taking into account our defense needs, the proper role of government, and the Graham Rudman Holland's deficit targets. And it will meet the fiscal year 87 deficit target of $144 billion without harming the economy through a tax increase and compromising our national security. It will preserve the social safety net for those who are truly in need and will not penalize older Americans by reducing Social Security benefits. And as I'm sure Captain Jim has mentioned, our budget will include a modest increase in defense to sustain recent improvements in capability. Now some will say that, too much, that that's too much for defense, but the proposed funding levels for national security in our budget are consistent with the real growth path that was agreed to by myself and the Congress last year. Incidentally, Bill Casey just the other day had to testify before the Senate and the House committees in this matter. We've been playing catch up. With all this drumbeat of propaganda about the defense budget, uh, ignored has been the situation of the great massive buildup of the Soviet Union. And we're still playing catch up. We haven't caught it yet. And I don't know whether I'm repeating something that maybe Campus said, but in the 10 years, just between 74 and 84, so that takes in some of our years. The Soviet Union has <coughs> procured three times as many intercontinental and submarine launch missiles as we have, six times as many intermediate range ballistic missiles, nine times the surface to air missiles, 50 times the bombers long range and medium that we have procured in the same period twice as many fighter planes, twice as many helicopters, twice as many submarines, three times as many tanks, and ten times as many artillery pieces. So I don't think that we're being extravagant 
in suggesting that we still have a little job to do in catching up with them. Higher taxes, as I said earlier, are no cure for the deficit. I think that reducing uh, the deficit by tax hikes would impose substantial new tax burdens on American households, and as experience has proved, would reduce incentives for Americans to work, save, and invest. That's choking off the creation of new jobs. Experience has also shown that higher taxes do not necessarily go to reduce the deficit, but more often they're used to justify increased government spending. The current economic expansion is well into its fourth year. Over nine million new jobs have been created since November of 1982. We've made significant progress in reducing inflation, but I'm not going to rest until it's down to zero. Nominal interest rates are coming down and are well below levels reached in the 70s and the early 80s. Excessive federal spending and a large federal deficit are the last major obstacles blocking our path, as I said, to lasting prosperity. The budget we're sending to the Congress on February 5th will put us on the right track to a balanced budget by fiscal year 1991. It'll reduce the deficit while promoting economic growth and meeting our national security requirements. We've made the tough decision. Now it's time to see if Congress is up to the challenge of passing a responsible budget. I need your help, and I encourage you to make your views known. I know we're in for a tough battle. Together we can reduce the deficit and set up our own path to permanent prosperity. But now that's enough for me. I'd like to hear from you. It's on your mind. <coughs> Questions? Maybe you have any questions. Thank you. 
thinking about a career change. <laughs> Not this political business. See if I can't do something different by radio or the movies. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll see a dramatic change for the better. You'll still be needing your help in the months ahead, keeping tax reform on track. As I outlined last night in the State of the Union, we turned the full $2,000 personal exemption for itemizers as well as non-itemizers, at least for those individuals in the lower income income bracket. Trusted increasing share of the tax burden on the shoulders of families and children. You might say, we think it's about time the federal government stopped putting personal exemption today equal in purchasing power at one of the 600. The exception would be $2,700. So that investment decisions aren't disrupted in the way you more certain. A minimum test of success. We should all reflect on the dramatic and revolutionary change that tax reform represents. We must work to promote the expansion of world trade and growth of the global economy by strengthening economic policy coordination among our industrialized trading partners. As I mentioned in the State of the Union, I have directed Treasury Secretary James Bacon to determine if the nations of the world should convene to discuss the global relationship of our currencies. Many developing countries with large debts are in particularly dire straits, and we in the industrial world must assist them in dealing with their difficulties. There's a denial of property rights. In particular, we must encourage them to avoid high tax rates that only choke off incentives and slow growth. The plight of many developing countries is desperate and the call to action is urgent. So let's begin now to spread hope and opportunity across the world by encouraging lower taxes, free and fair trade, and a sound monetary system and your traditional and essential enforcement activities, you're going to have your hands full of the Treasury. Working together, we can make 1986 the year that tax rate cuts open wide the doors of opportunity at home, and our program for sustaining growth will bring jobs, growth, and hope to financial, educational, social, and safety concerns of poor families. And I want the council to report to me by December 1st on evaluation and strategy for immediate action that we should take to meet these concerns. I believe that every person in our free society should have the opportunity to secure their basic living requirements, first through their own efforts, and then through the support by their family, the neighborhood, and their community. I also believe that many federal programs have not been working to make this happen. We have far too many people who are still dependent upon public assistance, and yet we spend huge sums of money that should be reducing this dependency. In fact, some federal programs appear to be increasing rather than decreasing the dependency of individuals and families, and I think that is the greatest proof that something is wrong. We should be motivating individuals and families to become more independent and economically secure through work efforts and initiative and not through government programs. So I'm asking the council to evaluate all of the federal programs in this area, to look at how these programs relate to one another, and to report to me on what actions we ought to make. And I'm not limiting a charge to specific programs, nor am I limiting what you may suggest to me later in the year. We need to explore any idea that may have merit. It's no easy task, I recognize that, and I look forward to a strategy we can realistically employ to solve a problem that we've lived with far too long. And I think
that will get on at the meeting. Is certain changes have taken place. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by Secretary Bowen. Cabinet, fellow employees of the Department of Health and Human Services, and friends, good afternoon. Today is special. To this cabinet member, I'm pleased that you, Mr. President, have chosen to honor health and human services employees by addressing us less than a day following your inspiring and challenging State of the Union address. I'm gratified that you have also proclaimed that Medicare catastrophic health coverage is a priority of your administration. As our first Republican President Abraham Lincoln said, Governor, government's role is to do only those things for people that they can't do for themselves. If this is true, then much of the government's domestic responsibilities reside in this department effectively. And we know that efficient and effective management is not the enemy of caring and compassionate programs, but in fact is necessary for a program's success. It is in this spirit that we welcome you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to introduce the President of the United States. Thank you very much, and I thank you for the last two presidents that visited here in their first term weren't re-elected. <laughs> we have, we've just entered six major initiatives ahead of us. We're going to move toward a more efficient health care system, and we're going to try to see if we can. As you know, I've asked Dr. Bowen to study how the private sector and government can work together on this problem and report to me by the end of the year. We continue to support emphasizes competition and broadening the type of health care plans that qualify as alternatives to traditional Medicare coverage. We will encourage private health care providers to develop. Isn't that wonderful the way I say we? But so much of it's going to be you. Well, we're going to take a look that doctors and others have to pay. And we're going to look at the practices that minimize malpractice exposure. These are just a few of our plans, but I want to mention one more. One of our highest public health priority on AIDS. Your plate is pretty full. But I know you're up to the job, you always have been. I want you to know that across town in the White House, we're aware of your good work, of how hard you work, and we appreciate it. And I just want you to know, we started a little Moss Hart, the playwright, who was an inveterate along that line. And so one night at a cocktail party in Hollywood, he was introduced to a Dr. Jones. And almost immediately, he started talking about, I've been having this low back pain, and the fellow that introduced them said, Moss. <laughs> no, I just, well, thanks again. God bless all of you.
Thank you.